Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for uh, June 12th, 2023. It's the time of week that we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jepler, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python design, designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar to view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. To receive those notifications, ask an admin or community moderator to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording, and the final notes document will have timestamps uh, to go along with it so that you can skip to the parts of the meeting that you are most interested in. Um, after each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes to the CircuitPython dev channel in the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages icon in the upper uh, right corner of the screen to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. And if you wish to participate but can't attend, just a reminder, you can leave your hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. Next up is community news, a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on, in, Python on hardware in the community and it's a preview of our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter compiled uh, by our own Ann B. Thank you, Ann. Then we have the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, where we look at the numbers that um, tell us the health of the entire project, separate from uh, what we're up to in kind of a narrative fashion. The third part, and when you all get to start participating, is called Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and to take the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. It's really the meat of the meeting, uh, an opportunity to report on what you've been up to. We invite everybody to take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last time you dropped in and what you hope to get up to over the next week or whenever you, uh, whatever time frame is, your, is relevant to you. And the fifth and optional part is in the weeds. If we need a more long-term discussion, um, that is where it happens. So we'll take those in the order that they are in the notes document when we, when we get there. And that covers how the meeting will go. And now a preview of the Circuit Python and Python on Hardware newsletter called Community News. Number one, CircuitPython 8.2.0 Beta 1 has been released. It is a beta, so um, we invite folks to try it out and let us know about any problems. There are links to the Adafruit blog as well as the release notes on GitHub. And thank you, Tim, for getting those links into the Discord channel. Um, so the highlights are continued enhancements of SynthIO, the addition of alarm.sleep memory on the RP2040, and reduced size of stack frames, which sounds a little technical, but um, it will help on some of our lower capacity devices. Next item is focus on RISC-V. A major tectonic shift away from ARM to RISC may be in the works for Qualcomm, Samsung, Google, Nvidia, and Apple, says an article at Patently Apple. You can get started with RISC-V quickly without using an FPGA or logic simulator with the RV32i RISC-V simulator, which can run MicroPython 1.19 and analyze the emulator to understand RISC-V, and there are some links to Twitter and GitHub. Next up, and the last item that I picked as a preview, is a video cast. Ardan Labs talks Adafruit, engineering, and forest service, sorry, foreign service with Ann Barella. Um, they spoke on a number of topics, and there is a link to the YouTube broadcast. So if you want to learn a little bit about a little bit more about Anne, as she's a very colorful character. Check that out. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash circuitpython. And uh, 
It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request. There are links in the uh, notes document. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And uh, yeah, we love hearing about your projects. We love uh, just anything, any news item. Please hit us up with those tips and make this newsletter the best newsletter that it can be. And that is community news. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is data that we retrieve from GitHub based on a seven-day period. It runs early in the morning. Um, so anything that has happened today, pull requests merged, uh, issues open or closed are not reflected in the report. Uh, but anyway, overall, our numbers were 17 pull requests merged from 14 authors and nine reviewers. And some names that are less familiar to me are Riza Almanda, Mario Broderman, GTB Coding, Garber W, Optional Lion 411, Apple Cuckoo, and a reviewer name that I didn't recognize was Milo's MNS. So thank you to those people who are newer or less frequent contributors. We'd love to see you uh, chipping in and making CircuitPython better. And also a big appreciation to the people who are steadily working on CircuitPython. Um, issues wise, we had 19 closed issues by nine people and eight open by seven people. It's always nice to see the issues number trend down a little bit across um, our GitHub repositories. And with that, uh, Scott will tell us the updates on the core. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Let me just pull it up. Uh, OK, so for the core, we had eight pull requests merged from seven different authors. So thank you to everybody who's contributing to the core. Uh, we had six reviewers as well, so thanks again to them. Uh, we have 21 open pull requests, so we're comfortably under that one page limit of 25. Uh, but a number of these, maybe eight or nine of them, are uh, 100 days or older. So we definitely should take a peek at those and see what we can finish. Um, it's always good to, to have fewer open. A number of these are draft, but um, still. <laughs> I'm a numbers person. Uh, I had the issues wise for the core, we had eight closed issues by four people and three open by two people. So we're net down five, which is awesome for a total of 655 open issues. Uh, GitHub.com slash Adafruit slash CircuitPython slash issues uh, for all of those. Ooh, sorry. Uh, for Adafruit folks, we have uh, milestones as a method of prioritization. Um, we have one issue for 8.2 stable. We had 37 open issues for 8xx. Um, and we had 30 open issues for 9.0. So we have our, our work cut out for us. Um, we have two issues not assigned to milestone. Um, that number will hopefully have gone down because uh, these numbers were taken overnight. Um, but that's where we're at uh, with the core. Thank you, Scott. And uh, are oh, you going to read the libraries or sh would you like me to? Oh, well, why like don't you go ahead? Yeah, Ketney had a conflict at the last minute, so please uh, feel free to continue on with the libraries. All right, I can, I, I can continue. Okay, so numbers for the libraries. This is anything on GitHub that is prefixed with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore. Um, this is, uh, these libraries tend to be run both on the core and on top of Blinka, um, and we'll go through that. So. For library stuff, we had nine pull requests merged from seven different authors. So thank, thank you again to all of those authors. Four reviewers. Uh, there was, it looks like, uh, nine merged pull requests. A number of those were only open for a single day. So thank you to our authors for being responsive there. Uh, there's also an issue that was open 81 days and it got closed. So thank you for following up with uh, issues or pull requests that have already been open. Uh, Issues wise for all of our libraries, we had 55, uh, actually there's 55 currently open pull requests. The oldest is 986 days old, the newest is at a single day old. Issues wise, 10 closed issues by five people and five open by five people, so net down five as well. For a total of 612 open issues across all of those libraries, 46 of which are good first issues. 
If you'd like to help with these, uh, there's a great landing page at circuitpython.org slash contributing to help get you started and cover what those issues are. Uh, now for download statistics, uh, this these cover the usage of these libraries in CPython via Blinka. Um, so the total ladder, library downloads for 310 libraries from PyPI is 114,658 downloads uh, in the last week. Um, the top libraries are, are pretty typical, uh, with bus device being the top and requests up there as well. Um, requests is interesting given that there's actually a proper request library in CPython as well. Uh, library updates in the last seven days. Uh, there's one new library in the community bundle from, or two new libraries, sorry. Uh, one from Toddbot, PS2 controller, and an H3 LAS 200DL from J Posada 2020. Uh, updated libraries, display notification, matrix keypad, EPD, RGB LED, MagCal, and PS2 controller. And that's it for the libraries. All right. And you talked a little bit about contributing. Um, so yeah, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing if you uh, would like to get a list of all pull requests, all open issues, as well as a list of rather dry library infrastructure issues. If you want to contribute for a first time, this is a great place to start. You can sort the issues by label, so you can search for good first issue if you're getting started, or bugger enhancement if you're looking for something a little more in-depth. We have a guide uh, to contributing on Git and GitHub, and we're always available to help you get started with things. Uh, here on Discord is a great place to ask, so let us know if you need any assistance. And now to round out the section uh, on the numbers, we will uh, hear about Blinka from Melissa. Hello. Hello. Uh, so for Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers, uh, we had zero pull requests merged this week. There are currently three open pull requests amongst the repositories. There was one closed issue by one person and none opened. Uh, we are That leaves us at 94 open issues. There were 13,682 Pi PI downloads in the last week, 6,903 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 119 boards. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. And next section is called Hug Reports. This is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everybody a chance to participate. And as a reminder, if you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. Uh, I want to give a hug to the community helpers and moderators as we dealt with a moderation issue last week. A hug to uh, Maker Melissa for doing some very thorough testing on a pull request of mine. To Paint Your Dragon for the Protomatter library and uh, working hard to make it work with CircuitPython. And uh, we just had a few things to change about the ESP32-S3 support. Um, and finally, a hug to Dan for the newest beta release. So it's always nice to see the incremental improvements in CircuitPython. And with that, I will hand it to Dan and then read notes from a few folks. Okay, thanks. So thanks to uh, Scott for um, trimming the size of C stack frames, which is really well, it looks gonna save a lot of space, I think, in RAM, not just make it possible for the CPX library to work. I think it'll actually help in a lot of ways. Uh, thanks to Carter, who's been um, tested out how to update NRF boards that have old bootloaders on them, really old bootloaders that can't self update. And, but there are ways to do this that are less trouble than I thought, and we're going to write this up uh, as uh, pages on the appropriate guides. <coughs> Excuse me, um, when we um, when we get the chance. And thanks to Foamy Guy who has been uh, looking at um, some existing PRs and made some of their own, uh, so that the API for ESP32 SPI is more like other network APIs. I think specifically the socket. API, they're, they're sort of needlessly different and kind of non-standard, the ESP32 SPI. And it's nice to see this coming together. It, it will be a major version change and people will need to update their code, but uh, it's really worth it. Okay. Yes, thank you, Dan. And a belated hug report to um, Naradoc and to you for help over the weekend with this NRF 
um, issue which I ran into and needed to update the bootloader. All right, next up I have notes from David Glode, who writes group hug, especially those working on new releases, new features, and synth. And then I have notes from uh, DJ Devon 3 who has a hug to Katni for being you, a hug for everyone involved with CircuitPython development in any fashion. Thank you. It's a wonderful language and everyone in the Adafruit dev community is exemplary. Hugs for JP, Liz, Toddbot, Gambler, and me. Thank you for wonderful bleeps and bloops. One for Naradoc for being a keystone helper with CircuitPython. And finally, uh, for Lady Ada and PT, thank you for everything you've created. Uh, and that brings us to Foamy Guy. Hello. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, hug reports for me this week. Thank you to uh, Michael Pokusa and Nerdoc, who both helped uh, me and offered some discussion around HTTP post uh, request argument formats. Uh, another uh, one, thank you to Nerdoc, who also helped me this week with some questions about running a server and broadcasting Wi-Fi AP at the same time. And a uh, hug report to uh, Mark Gambler, Tyeth, and DJ Devon, uh, all of whom uh, offered up some ideas for troubleshooting some weirdness that I was seeing with USB devices when my PC boots up. Uh, and that's what I've got for now. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, next, I have notes from Katni. A hug to Dan H for putting together a rainbow cycle key switch press demo for me when I couldn't figure it out. And a group hug. And then we've got uh, Maker Melissa and Scott. So go ahead, Melissa. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give a hug to you, Jeff, for fixing the RGB matrix module so quickly and uh, group hug to everyone else. You are welcome. All right, Scott, what's on your mind? Hello. Okay, so hugs firstly to Naradoc, to Shipu, DJ, Devon3, and Carter for helping folks on Discord and the help with CircuitPython channel. Always awesome to see that folks can go there and get help. I really appreciate everybody who does that. And then a uh, hug to you, Jeff, for the swirl idea for mounting Stemma and fe other feather boards on what looks or what was originally a 0 0.2 inch grid, but uh, you had the great idea of how to add some slots to make it a lot more flexible. So I really appreciate it. All right. And finally, I have notes from Todd Bod, who's text only today. Uh, a hug to Fumi Guy for helping with weird community bundle Gawk bug with PS2 controller. I think Gawk is the name of a program in this case. Uh, to Gambler for SynthIO testing, and to me for SynthIO filters. And that completes Hug Reports. Next is Status Updates. Status Updates is your time to tell folks what you're up to. I will start and we'll go through the list in the document order. When I call on you, take a couple of moments to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you plan to be up to in the near future. It's also an opportunity to provide any quick tips and tricks relevant to what people are talking about. But if it is uh, lasting more than a few sentences, we'd prefer to move it down to in the weeds. And uh, with that, I will get started. I integrated an updated version of the Protomatter library in CircuitPython. This is the library that uh, makes the Hub75 style RGB matrices work. And the heavy lifting is done by Phil B and it's done in a way that we can reuse the library in CircuitPython, even though it's designed first and foremost for Arduino. And uh, this version, among other things, had really improved support of the ESP32 S3 microcontroller, which is important for an upcoming Adafruit product. And there are pending pull requests in Protomatter and CircuitPython for that. Uh, second item is I've been putting the finishing touches on a non-CircuitPython guide, the Run CPM emulator with RP2040. If you're interested in what that is, I've shown it at least once on Show and Tell. And uh, next up, we'll be um, working on this Teddy Ruxpin um, stuffed animal animatronic thing that uh, Lamora has done some um, engineer segments on, uh, reverse engineering it. And I'm going to help with creating new story files uh, by putting together disparate pieces of information such as the eye movements and the mouth movements and the specially transcoded audio file. And uh, so these other items, the SynthIO guide and the MicroPython merge, 
those will come after that. Uh, Teddy Ruxpin will be the next thing that I'm working on. And I never imagined in my life that I would say I'm working on reverse engineering Teddy Ruxpin, but here we are. And next up is Dan. Okay, so last week I uh, released uh, beta one of CircuitPython 8.2.0, uh, mostly to get the last bit of SynthIO changes in it. Um, there'll be uh, another, we, we hope to have a the release candidate or another beta really soon for 8.2.0. I started merging MicroPython v1.19.1 into CircuitPython. Uh, I went through that and then I said, I kind of realized that I wasn't sure about a bunch of things. So I've restarted it and will be more careful doing this. I This has happened before. I, it's kind of what you expect when you're looking at a whole bunch of changes that you're not sure uh, what what they correspond to. And we do have uh, a bunch of uh, bugs, a little bit of a backlog of things to look at to see if we should fix them quickly or not, or more quickly. So I need to look at some of those too. Uh, there are a variety of different ones. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I'll read notes from a few people. Uh, the, then the next person after that will be Tim. Uh, so David Glode writes, uh, CircuitPython quickly added a Teams mute button to my mouse jiggler with a twist. Control-Shift-M works on QWERTY, but I replaced M by semicolon for Azerty. The learn guide is Arduino only. There's a link in the notes doc. And I found this to help me. It's a link to firstscene.com. Um, and yeah, check out those links in the notes document if you're interested in the Teams mute button. Uh, David goes on to write, I've not been here since months, mostly because I've not written a piece of code since then. I try to stay in sync with streaming or listening to podcasts. And in non-CircuitPython, uh, playing with HID Remapper on the Feather RP2040 USB host, and wasting time on blocky football programming games at supercollidingball.com, as well as Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp. And next I have notes from DJ Devon 3 who writes, uh, updated my MQTT Featherwing with better graceful fails with Wi-Fi connection, API server fails, or Arduino IO MQTT fails. It's been my main project for about three years and has evolved a lot since starting on an Arduino Uno. Thank you to everyone who has helped me along the way. My participation in the community will become more limited in the weeks or months ahead as I'm dealing with a personal matter downsizing where I can and waiting for the inevitable move. Being part of this community has been time well spent. And uh, of course, DJ Devin, we will be here and happy to see you back when you are able to spend more time and absolutely take care of yourself and, and all that stuff. Uh, and now I will pass the talking stick to Foamy Guy. All right, uh, thank you. Um, over the past week, I did some more digging into Core Display I.O. I made many different builds with many different additional print statements added to try to figure out how the internal fields uh, for area, a previous area and current area inside of tile grid behave. I think that I have an understanding of that now and I have also a proposed solution for the issue of the hidden things taking extra time to render, uh, but it is still in my local branch. I need to clean it up and get it pushed into the PR to get feedback on it. Uh, so that's what I'll be doing uh, this week for some part of the time. Um, I also did some work uh, over the past weekend, Friday and Saturday, tracing through the request library as well as PyPortal and Porterbase libraries to figure out um, more specifically like what happens and what controls what when you download larger files uh, with chunked downloads. Um, specifically, there was some difference in behavior between the two different uh, socket APIs, like ESP32 SPY versus the other one. Um, uh, so I have a note down in the weeds to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I yesterday uh, had a much needed uh, personal organizing and putting things away party. So I've got a lot of my microcontrollers and things a lot more organized and away now, which is really nice. Um, outside of the CircuitPython world, I deployed a Rocket Chat server uh, this week, which is an open source um, kind of 
thing like Slack or Teams type environment, uh, but it's self-hosted. You can run it on your own server. Um, it is not really related to CircuitPython, my reasons for using it, but once I did get it deployed and started digging in a bit, I noticed that it does have uh, what looks like a pretty easy to use API. So maybe I will make some uh, things where CircuitPython can interact by uh, like sending in sensor readings into the chat rooms or uh, maybe vice versa, like controlling IoT um, lights or things like that from the chat rooms uh, look like it'd be pretty easy to do. So um, that's what I have got going on. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, I have notes from Katni. Last week, she worked on the Feather RP2040 DVI guide, and that is now published, and continued work on the Neo Key Breakouts guide. This week, she will wrap up the Neo Key Breakouts Guide, do the TRRS Jack Breakout Guide, the Stemma QT Gamepad Guide, and the I2S BFF Guide. And next we have Maker Melissa. Hello again. Hello. Uh, so this last week, I added a bunch of new, a few new boards to circuitpython.org. I updated the portal base and matrix portal libraries to work on chips other than the M4. Um, I tested and updated the CircuitPython code editor and fixed some CSS issues. And I also updated it to work with the latest version of the JavaScript CircuitPython Rebel library. Um, I tested Jeff's RGB matrix and proto matter updates for CircuitPython, and I started going through and testing all the matrix portal guides after the changes. Uh, this week I'm going to finish going through all the guides and then I'll continue working on some Git, GitHub issues and probably some minor guide updates as well. And that's it. Thank you. All right, now we have Scott. Hello. Um, so as Dan, I think, mentioned, I investigated the issue with importing the CPX library on the CPX. Um, I did a couple changes. One, I prevented some inlining uh, into the VM call, like the big VM function. Uh, there's multiple, like if you call multiple Python functions, that gets called multiple times um, recursively. So I uh, made that use less stack, which means you should be able to recurse more now um, after that. Uh, I also reduced the max file path length. Uh, this is something that's computed during imports. Um, and also prevent a, or and as also happen recursively if you have like if you're importing one file which or imports another file, it can get stacked as well. So there should be improvements there. Um, I rebuilt the PySigRock Pico binaries. They seem to work okay, which I thought they weren't working, and now they work, which is great. Um, I added proper board deaths for Scorpio and the pirate boards for that as well, and that was the motivation is getting the pirate board supported. Um, I took a detour into KiCad generation and uh, gener created a generator for the swirl mounting style that Jeff came up with. I really appreciate that, and I'm excited to see uh, Lamore ordered like 200 of them, so hopefully they came out okay. Uh, I'm working on USB hosts on the IMXRT. Uh, I did get it reading HID reports, which is great, um, but I do think I'll wait until after 8.2 is merged and, and, or is out uh, because it includes a tiny USB update. Uh, this week, I may look into getting it working on the RP2040 Feather as well. Uh, Friday, I think, I spent some time getting CircuitPython building with Clang 16. Uh, Clang is the, the C compiler in the LLVM project, which is a larger tooling, compiler tooling project, which is pretty awesome. Um, I did it for Clang 13 as well. Um, so I do want to make a PR this time because I'm making a lot of the same changes again. Um, it's things like all functions must like need to have void in an empty friends sort of thing. And if you're doing a macro to disable or enable, you need to do it in an if macro, not in a not in a C macro that gets the like static value. Um, so I'll probably do a PR for that. Um, maybe not with full clang building, but at least with some of the fixes. Um, my goal is to get a branch building with Clang so that I can go to the LLVM embedded folks and be like, here's the, here's the blockers for us. We'd love to adopt it, but this is what we need help with. Um, I'm particularly interested in adding better memory region support so that we can more easily say, like, this function that writes Flash needs to go in RAM, and 
have it implicitly do everything that that function calls as well. Because right now it doesn't, and it's just a, a huge pain to get right. Um, and I'm sure a source of bugs. Uh, I'm looking into Odroid Go issues today, which Dan, I think, identified as some blockers for 8.2. And then on, New on Wednesday, I'm heading to New York to uh, meet up with Adafruit folks and just and Dan and have just kind of a, a vacation as well. Um, I'm back on Monday, uh, so I will be kind of around consistently outside of that. And that's it for me. All right, thank you. Um, and last, I have notes from Toddbot, who writes, Old PS1 and PS2 controllers are pretty rad and cheap. Too bad their connector is bonkers. Not sure how useful this will be or if it will live here, but CircuitPython Tricks now has a SynthIO Tricks section, and there is a link in the notes doc. Uh, two small SynthIO examples yet to be integrated into the above. There is a two-voice drone synth and dueling bandpass filters. I've seen the video of the latter one, by the way. That uh, video is pretty cool, Todd. Uh, also links in the notes document. And finally, we'll be looking into potential USB raw HID issues. The USB, the, excuse me, the lib USB devs are having trouble as they're trying to create repeatable test hardware. And that is also one last uh, link that's in the notes doc. And that completes status updates. Thank you, everybody. It's lovely to hear what you're all up to. And now we will finish up the meetings with the In the Weeds section. And uh, Scott's got the first topic, so go ahead and let us know what's up. Yeah, so I, I was just looking at the, the list of open issues on A2. I thought the CPX one was there because I put it there, but apparently this Ojo goes the other one. And I just wanted uh, to briefly have a chance to talk 8.2 release, because um, I know Dan's working on the MicroPython merge, so we're going to want to do that after 8.2. Yeah, I was just wondering, we can continue. We might even have an 8.3, if because if going to 9.0 takes a long time, we might want to mm -hmm. have more stable releases in between, so we might want to kind of stop doing work on main, or else I was thinking of putting the merging the 9.0 stuff on its own branch, and then we can merge it back. Some or something like that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think the question there is like, we have good infrastructure for testing the latest main, um, which I think is really valuable. Um, yeah. I don't know. I guess I, I'm, I'm in, the, in the camp of like, let's just move to 9. Yeah, the question is, so if we... We could always backport things right. to to eight, right? Or have people do right. Yeah. Yeah, for bug fixes and Right. Right. And I think we work. talked about we didn't want we don't want to do a pre release nine until we have the right MPY version. Right. Right. Yeah. But it would be great to get those merge the MicroPython merges in be good too. So I think if you look at the Odroid thing, and, and as I said in our internal meeting, if we look at what else is on the 8xx list and see if right. there's anything that really seems like it is more of a showstopper, which I think yeah. not, because it would have been put on 8.2.0. So right. then we can go ahead and release like 8.2.0 soon, like a release candidate <laughs> this week or excuse me, uh, early next week or something, yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Any other thoughts? So I think there's the possibility that this upgrade in the RGB matrix thing would be disruptive, but Melissa has done a lot That's of right. testing, so she tested across all of the um, different supported microcontroller families. Um, right. But that's something that, because it'll support this new product, I think we'll want that in an 8 and not have to wait for 9. Uh, oh, okay. But there are ways to manage that, so I don't think it should be a barrier. But I, I also think it should be resolved this week and, you know, all merged. So maybe that would be the thing to hold final for. I don't know. Yeah, we, yeah. I'm happy. Do we have... Go ahead. I was just going to say, do we have an issue for that? Uh, I don't think there's an issue. There's only a pull request. So it can mark the pull request A2O. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they don't throw I, up I, in, the I, list. Yeah. in the milestone list. Yeah. 
That's a good idea. Thank you, Dan. Um, all right, I marked it. That's it for me, just to figure out 8 2. All right. Uh, our second topic then is from Foamy Guy. Uh, all right, thank you. I figured this would be easiest just to ask about because I didn't know the history of this stuff. So uh, essentially this all relates to the PR that's open in ESP32 SPY, which was an effort to make the socket be compatible with uh, the other sockets, like the built-in uh, socket for the other ports, like ESP32 S2 and Pico W as well as the socket on CPython, I believe all behaved the same, but they were different from ESP32 SPY. Um, I figured out eventually where the code that I think is responsible for the difference uh, in behavior lies, and it was ultimately in the request library. Uh, some of the code in there is referring to stuff like backwards compatibility, so it will do some check to decide if the socket is backwards compatible or not. Uh, and if it is, it will behave one way, and if it's not, then it will behave a different way. Um, I wanted to bring it up, though. Like, my best guess there was that that backwards compatibility is essentially talking about that different behavior on the ESP32 SPY. Um, that seemed to be the case from what I could tell, but I didn't have any of that actual history or anything to know if that's certain uh, what it was. Um, to go along with that in the request library, there's also some tests. Uh, test scripts in the test folder and some of those refer to like legacy tests like legacy testing the um, socket um, and I was also coming to the conclusion that those legacy tests that have that term in the name were referring essentially to the same quirk those were testing to make sure that the backwards compatibility or uh, what I'm thinking is the different behavior from ESP32 spy those were testing to make sure that behavior was working um, if that is in fact the case, backwards compatibility and legacy are referring to that difference in behavior in ESP32 SPY, uh, does it make sense to go ahead and remove it entirely, or do we need to try to keep the tests working uh, for that legacy mode? Um, or is it possible that I'm just uh, off, off the trail and that the backwards compatibility and the legacy are actually referring to something else? I figured it would be easiest just to ask the group um, if anybody had insight to that. So I think it is the case that it's because of the quote legacy is ESP32 SPI. There might have been some other things that were like that too. Um, you, you see that pull request, pull 167, I did it like over a year ago. Yep. And uh, it was because I was frustrated by how it was different and it was making eight different requests not work right and it was. Also, there was this random web server code there that wasn't like other web servers, and that was also a problem. So I, I was trying to clean all that up, and it kind of got into something larger. And then you came along, and it looked like it almost worked, except it didn't. And now you figured out why, which is great. So I think it would be great to continue that. I agree that it should happen at the same time. I was thinking about whether, well, the test for backwards compatibility right now checks whether receive into is exists, and that isn't a good test anymore, but there are some other things that you could test for, like read line. But then I thought, but anybody who does this, we don't really want people to update one library and not the other. So I think we should just say that those two things go together. And there, this is a breaking change on both those libraries, and we'll release them on the same day, and they'll get into the same bundle. Okay, so, yeah, that uh, makes. I I don't know if there's anything else to test. Um, there's Wiznet. Is Wiznet yeah. maybe also different and special? I don't know about that. That's a good point. Wiznet. Off the top of my head, I think it is its own third case, and I think it. Um, well, maybe it's not. Maybe that's not the best way to refer to it. But I think that its socket behaves the same as C Python and built-in do, uh, rather than like the ESP32 SPI did. Um, but I can also test that. I have the Wiznet stuff set up somewhere that I can grab and easily check. 
another thing to test, uh, I don't know if it's worth it or not, but it may, whether ESP32 SPI with these new changes now works with HTTP servers, the new HTTP server. Uh, yes, I did have that thought as well. I did try it out. It does not work uh, as is. There is an error about something, but I don't, I didn't dig any further just yet other than like trying to run the simple test. If you're willing to look at that, that would be great. Okay. And yeah, I can also keep... there, since I made that poll so long ago, uh, part of it was also trying to um, make the thrown exceptions be the same in the two libraries and um, or in in like built-in Wi-Fi and the other thing. And that maybe there's some updating that needs to be checked. That might be causing some incompatibilities. I don't know. Okay. So, part, uh, so part, double check. Part of, part of the regularizing of the of the exceptions was already somebody already did part of that work i don't remember the details so yeah if you're willing to keep working on this that would be yeah. great and then we'll have a big bang change and then it'll be better <laughs> it'll be we won't be living with this it's so much trouble and people keep complaining people it's a support issue that esp32 sbi is different so yeah. It would be nice if it was not. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I can definitely do that. I'll confirm Wisnet. I will double check the um, errors that are raised and make sure those match the built in socket as well. And then um, I will plan on removing that legacy test then for now to get that PR to pass because that mm -hmm. is, I believe, the only thing keeping it from. Uh, and did you want to try, okay, and did you want to try to test HTTP server on the... Yes, yes. yeah, I will keep going on that one and see if I can get it working. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. It also comes to mind the other like major socket library would be the MQTT library, and whether it has had to work around the differences of ESP32 SPI or whether it didn't have to. Um, so that might also be worth just taking a quick look at to, yep. to make sure you didn't break compatibility. Yep, thank you. That is definitely a good thought. I had not considered MQTT. I definitely want to make sure. So, and like Adafruit IO will depend on that um, right. as well. Yeah, I think most things that do network are going to do it by importing one of those two libraries. There may be another one that I'm not thinking of either, but that's going to be, you know, HTTP is going to be the most of it requests, and MQTT is going to get the next huge fraction of whatever's left. Yep. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah, I think that gives me uh, the next couple of things to work on, so I should be good to keep going on it. Thank you. I'm excited about this work, which I hadn't heard of till now, so I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that wraps up our In the Weeds section, and so I'm going to wrap up this meeting. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for June 12th, 2023. A big thank you to everybody who participated. Remember that if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and folks like me who work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com adafruit, and the podcast will follow on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting is moved by a day. Uh, next Monday, many parts of the U.S. observe the Juneteenth holiday, and so the meeting is moved to Tuesday, June 20th, at the regular time of um, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. So we'll see you in eight days. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We look forward to seeing everybody next week. Have a great week, everybody.